This talk was originally titled Writing Extensible and Testable Code Using Event Dispatcher, but I found that the whole testing philosophy behind it, like what I really wanted to communicate with it, was too large for the time slot. So I, I went ahead and cut it from the presentation. But so it this will be writing extensible code using the event dispatcher. So a little bit about me to start out with. I have been programming in I'm John Carey, sorry by the way, for those that don't know me. Um, John Carey, I live in Lawrence and have been using PHP since 2005. I'm currently a contract PHP developer out of Lawrence, but uh, up until July of this last year, I had been working for the University of Kansas in their central IT organization, um, working with the main central uh, web development shop at KU and was their lead programmer there. Um, helped build up their team to be competent and work fully well as a team and that good jazz. I've pretty much worked in the education and trucking industry for the most part in a lot of my development. Um, with my trucking industry experience I work with a company out of Colorado to help hire truck drivers to trucking companies so they come through us to rapidly hire on drivers and I've built uh, most of their online application to allow that to happen and then some back-end SOAP stuff that integrates with a background check service through a, a, a very large background check company out of Irvine, California. Uh, so anyway, I'm also really involved with the Symphony community and really think that they do really great work and uh, Sorry, I just noticed my timer hadn't started, but it doesn't really matter because we're all good here. Um, I'm also in I'm also involved with the, the composer community a little bit and I've been contributing some code back to them as I described a little bit earlier um, But anyway today uh, we're going to mostly be talking about the Symphony 2 event dispatcher component and like Symphony, at least the mindset behind Symphony, it is a fully decoupled component. It doesn't have any other dependencies on it, so you can fully use this in your project, assuming that um, your project has a good way of integrating with decoupled components. So if you're using like Zen Framework or Zen Framework 2, um, you can, or even like most custom frameworks can probably figure out some way to finagle Event Dispatcher into it. But um, if you wanted to add it to your Composer JSON file, if you're using Composer, that's pretty simple. Just add that to your require statement and run PHP Composer update. But we're mostly going to be talking about like the beginner level of how what an event dispatcher is, how it could potentially be utilized for your application. So a quick overview of what I'll be talking about will be the, uh, I'll start with some procedural PHP, which I know we all have used in here before. We'll refactor it to be object oriented in its very basic nature. And then I'll talk a little bit about extensibility and controllers in model view controller and kind of what the controller's responsibility is and maybe how Event Dispatcher can help flesh that out to be more extensible. Uh, we'll get into some really cool graphs and animations that I put together to describe how Event Dispatcher works. And then we'll refactor our, our old uh, object-oriented code to be driven by Event Dispatcher, which is still object-oriented, don't get me wrong, but um, uses kind of a different model. And then we'll talk about some caveats with the event dispatcher. So some of the topics that I hope that you're familiar with that will maybe help you really grasp this presentation the best are if you've done at least a little bit of object-oriented programming and are familiar with some of the basic concepts behind it. And a lot of these could just be used as you know buzzwords. You hear people throw them around a lot. But um, as long as you're comfortable knowing what an object is and how it can function, that's really the, the thing that you need to be most familiar with. Um, hopefully you've worked with the model view control model view controller design pattern or at least know a little bit about it. If you've worked with JavaScript events um, such as like click handlers and other kind of stuff like that in the browser uh, you'll be pretty at home with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, dependency injection is used very heavily in uh, what I'm going to be talking about um, and then two design philosophies of separation of concerns which is you know mostly separating your program into distinct features that overlap you know as little as possible. So separating your concerns between, hey, I have one class that's responsible for uh, crafting an email, but an email shouldn't necessarily know how to send itself, right? So the email shouldn't need to know if it's being sent out by an SMTP server or send mail or connecting to a POP server somewhere and sending it that way. Uh, your, your concern should be separated in that those two concepts are fully decoupled from each other. And that also ties into the single responsibility principle as well, to where your class should have one reason to change and that that functionality is, is very well encapsulated within that object. So it's not spilling out into all different places of your program. So 
So this is going to kind of set up the narrative for today and kind of the, the ideas that, that I've got. So this is you. Feet up on desk, hot shot, Mr. Like a Boss Programmer. You've got your PHP cookbook on the shelf, which you've read. The spine is now limp because you've referenced it so often. You've got your awesome ergonomic keyboard, your trinkets, your easy button, a lava lamp, and you've even got a little copy of the TPS report up there. And man, do you love cats. And best of all, you work at a startup called DemCrookedWidgets.com. You've got this guy, the boss. Everywhere he goes, he's smoking a cigarette. And before you know it, you've got a new email in your inbox. It says, John, customers are unhappy. Send them a welcome email after they register on the website. Tell them we're glad to have them as a customer. That'll teach them. Do it now. Signed, the boss. So before we begin, a quick word of caution also that the code in this presentation is not production ready. And what I mean by that is I have to condense this code a lot to get it to fit on the slides and to make it easily digestible. So I'm using a lot of abbreviated variable names. I'm not using any namespaces. Um, I'm not using any data validation, any escaping or error checking. Of course, this is all stuff that you would be doing with your actual production code. So my first slide of procedural PHP has any and whatever. You could inject whatever you want into post name and it would get piped into email. So you know, it's vulnerable to header, header injection and all kinds of crazy stuff here. So fully disregard that. I'm just doing this for the sake of demo. So procedural PHP. Most of us should be familiar with how this works and kind of what we're doing. So we're really just accepting a post request that has two fields to it. So let's pretend that we had a form somewhere that just had the user's name and their email address, and that's being posted back to our script. Um, then we're going through and building an email and just establishing the subject, the message, injecting the user's name into it, setting some basic mail headers, and then dispatching the mail. So this code, as we know, runs from top to bottom. It's procedural. It's how we all pretty much learned programming, whether it was with something really simple like basic or, you know, most of us start in a, in a procedural language, so. Anyway, but, you know, you've been reading your PHP cookbook quite a bit, and you've heard a little bit about this object-oriented stuff, so you decide to give it a try. So if we take our code and think about how it could be separated, we've really got one section at the top that could be classified as a customer object. So if we take that and encapsulate it inside of an object, we would just be taking in the data array and piping it to some of the properties that we have for a customer, their simple name and their simple email address. And we just provide some basic getters uh, to access that outside the object. So if we jump back, we're also looking at some code that would just be able to craft a welcome email. So the responsibility of these two things is one, with the customer, maintaining all data relative to the customer itself, and then the welcome email, which is just building, building the email. Again, it doesn't know how to necessarily send it, but in this case, I'm gonna let it send itself for the sake of example, so whatever the case, but. So the welcome email is pretty easy. It has one public method. So that public method, all it does is just takes in the email address of who it needs to be sent to and the name of the person in the email. So pretty simple. Uh, all a collaborating object needs to know to use this object is that we have a send method which can be called with, a, with somebody's email address and their name. That's it. Outside of this object, we don't care how the underlying implementation is done. We don't care how the subject gets built, how the message body gets built. We just care that there's one method, send, that can be used with two arguments. So our, our email class is very well encapsulated, has one responsibility to build the mail. Well, I guess two because of the sending of it, but again, sake of example. So then if we needed to actually combine these two classes together to actually use them, we might wrap this in like a controller method. So here we have a basic controller method that would handle um, posting to a route at, at slash person. And I don't, I'm not including any of the code for how we do um, request resolution and controller dispatching or anything like that. Just assume that when slash person is called on our cool, awesome dim, dimcrookedwidgets.com, it's going to execute this code. So again, we take in the post into the customer object. It will internally assign the uh, name and the email address. Then we'll have our welcome email and 
then we'll just use the welcome email to send the customer email and customer name. Our email will get sent and that's all we got. So, you know, the boss hears about your success and he really likes the way you're doing stuff now. So, of course, he drops more responsibility on you, right? So he says, John, advertising wants to know how many new customers we're getting. Set up some logging. I don't want their grubby hands on the database. That'll teach them. Do it now. Signed, the boss. So we're going to add some more logging to our application here. So when a new user or a new customer is created, we're going to just log this to disk. So we're going to set up a basic log file and uh, through that'll be encapsulated with an object called disk logger. Now I'm not going to go into how that all works because this is a really simple class. So we're just going to assume that we take the path to the log file as the argument to the constructor and all we have is a log method which just adds a new line to that log file. Pretty simple, right? So, you know, now you just go back, kick your feet back up on your desk and watch some more cat videos on YouTube because that's what you do. So then the boss comes back and says, John, marketing wants to run statistics on orders. Keep them away from the database too. Just add to that other log file we set up for advertising. That'll teach them. Do it now. Signed, the boss. So once again, we're going to add some more logging. So we're going to assume that we have a create method and a, or a, a create order method and a cancel order method. So again, these would handle different routes on our, on our application. And we slap in some logging there, but it's the same object. So we're kind of duplicating some of our code, but at this point we probably really don't care. We got cat videos to watch. So, you know, we get more requests from the boss for logging. So all of a sudden he wants to receive a new email every time users are registering on the site. You know, maybe he wants to send them a personal welcome message or something like that, or wants to just get a good feel of how often they're registering. I don't know. It's the boss. He doesn't always know what he's talking about, right? Us bosses in the room should just not say anything. So, um, and he also wants to get an email when the cancel order thing, uh, when somebody cancels an order. So, again, we're duplicating some code here. And then the boss discovers Twitter. So anytime somebody creates an order through the site, he wants us to tweet at them and just, you know, say, hey, thanks for ordering or something like that. So do you kind of see what's happening with our code base here? It's growing. And it's not like a healthy growth. This is like, if your code base was a garden, each piece of this functionality that you're adding is like a weed. And that weed that is taking away from your project's maintainability and testability, really, I guess it's extensibility. So, you know, what can we... What can we do about this? Like, I mean, this code's not all bad. Like, what's good about this code that we're showing right here? I'll take any responses you want to throw at me. Everything's at least separating into why it's doing what it's doing. Yeah, it's, it's, it is very well. You're right. It is very well encapsulated. We've kind of separated our concerns as they are. Um, but maybe, how could this code be better? You want to separate out? Logging and emailing kind of have into their own little world so you can call them from each individual function. So have like a common logging object somewhere that we can just always use that one single one? So we don't have the duplicate that logic all over? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the code duplication that we've got all over could really be improved. Um, we've got basically two of those locations that we could fix up. Uh, you know, like we've got some hard-coded configuration in here. This goes a little bit with our duplicated code, but think about like if we're executing this code in, in different environments, if you're executing it in development and in production and in staging, you might not want to log to the production log file, whether wherever that is, you know, in your, in your dev environment or your staging environment. You might not want to post to the company's Twitter account when you're just developing and playing with stuff. You might not want every email that your test application tests sending stuff to the boss. Um, yeah. So if you also look, we have a lot of new operators in here also. And every time you use a new operator in your code, you're creating what's called tight coupling between the class that's calling that code and the class that you're instantiating. So right now, our customer and our welcome email and everything are very tightly coupled to our controller. And what I mean by that is we couldn't inject a different kind of customer or a different kind of email to be sent right there. The controller is explicitly, con <laughs> the controller is explicitly controlling what's being called. <laughs> um, 
So there's, there's better ways that we can code this to provide us more seams for uh, doing like testable mock objects and stuff like that. And I'm not going to so much go into that, but um, anyway. So we've also got some hard-coded dependencies in that every time our new operate, every time our new customer is created, it's always going to log. It's always going to send an email. Um, what if we wanted it to not do that at all? Like we couldn't do that with this code because we've always got an instance of disk logger. So it's always going to log to disk. What if we were able to add in there like in our development environment, like a null logger. So every time you call log on your, on your logger class, it just returns. It doesn't do anything with it, you know. Same thing with our email logger and our Twitter client. We don't necessarily want to do all of those in our different environments. So, so if we look at what extensibility is from Wikipedia's standpoint, it's just a system design principle where the implementation takes into account consideration for future growth. So what that's basically saying is you're trying to make your code base growable for the future in unforeseen ways that you haven't foreseen yet. So for example, if you have a plugin that's used in say Drupal or WordPress or something like that, there's no way that you could foresee the way that all the open source, de open source developers would be using your code. So is there a way that we can code our plugins that they could be used and extended without somebody modifying our original code? Probably. And Event Dispatcher is, is one way that that can be done. It might be a little heavy handed for like a Drupal module, but anyway. So right now we, we talked about kind of the limitations of a lot of this code and kind of established that it's not really extensible. So let's talk a little bit about model view controller and specifically the controller piece. So what's the responsibility of a controller? Does anybody want to offer up a guess? Application flow? So would you call that maybe logic? No, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to put logic in our controllers, actually. If you think about what a controller should be, I think there's a lot of misbelief in model view controller that logic should be in the controller because everybody says, oh, your model is your database stuff and your controller is like your, where you do everything, right? And I, I see things a little bit differently. I see controllers as glue. And I see controllers as glue between your framework code or whatever your architecture code is and your custom domain code your, or your custom application code. So the controller sits in the middle of this and it takes, for example, a request that comes in through your framework, however that is, um, and it says, and again, that, that's all the stuff that I didn't include in the presentation, so that was like the, the request handling, the controller dispatching, how it gets to say, how does slash person delegate down to this controller method, right? Like that's all in the architecture and wiring of your framework or application stack, right? So your controller is kind of that middle glue that takes that process, it stops right there after it gets into that controller method, and then it takes like the request object, say, and throws it down to your custom application code or throws pieces of it down. So let's say like the post array or the get string, like query parameters. It takes those and translates them from the framework side and gives them as input to your custom application. So because your custom application just knows that it needs to accept the number three or this array somewhere, you're not coupling your custom application to your framework. So you could essentially swap out your framework and start using something different. So if you had Zen Framework, your controller is knowledgeable about both. It's knowledgeable about Zen Framework and it's knowledgeable about your custom application. So if we were to change to a different framework, your controller would only change in how it takes requests and translates them to custom application code. Your custom application code shouldn't change just because you changed frameworks. Your controller is that insulation layer in between the two. And I think a lot of this logic goes in the controller thing came from when people are kind of trying to grasp what MVC is, a lot of them go back to like the Rails stuff and a lot of it is, oh, here, look, we do user.find, pass it an ID or user.find all and iterate through everything. 
and you do like all this work in your controller. And I think that's just not, it's not good for like the long term of your project. So anyway, Event Dispatcher, let's talk about the concept behind it and maybe how we can leverage it. So we have a general request response cycle here. Our request starts at the top and we do a whole bunch of stuff before we eventually return a response to the browser. Uh, so your framework or application stack might throw certain events that happen during the course of this execu execution. So like the kernel.request event could be when the actual request is received and your framework has taken like the post array and the get array and like put it into like this object, right? And then the rest of the framework can work with this request object to do something. So let's say we wanted to listen to this event and we could say, when this event occurs really early in my application stack, let's inspect the IP address. Let's make sure that this user is coming from like a known IP range. Because if they're not, let's just return a 404 response right away. Let's not even bother going to the database, processing of you making something. Let's just get them out of there right away. So you can listen to different events that are fired by your framework to do different things. But sandwiched in between there, we can fire our own events. So this would be like, within your controller code or as your code is executing. So events like, like a login every time a user logs in or a user registers. So when we fire these events, we can pass along with it the user object that just logged in or that just registered. So let's say a user just registered. If we passed along the new, the new user object, we could get access to everything they just posted in the form. Well everything that was just added to the customer object itself. Like our custom code only interacts and knows about our own customer object, but elsewhere in the code base, we've translated this post code and created a customer object, passed the data into it, and our, our code works with that customer object. So let's talk about the idea of the event dispatcher itself. So you have an event dispatcher object and Inside of it, it tracks what are called listeners. Listeners will listen for a specific event to occur. And it says, hey, event dispatcher, when this event occurs, let me know. And you're going to have several different listeners that listen for different types of events that do different things. So when the, when the event dispatcher then notifies the listener that this event occurred, the listener does some work. We don't know what it is right now, but let's use a more concrete example to really drive home kind of this idea. So let's say we have an e-commerce site where we've got just a general shopping cart and the customer can do certain things. So let's say we have a listener called cart listener, which is just a PHP class, and it has a method called on add to cart. So the listener is saying, hey event dispatcher, when cart.add event is fired, let me know and call this function on my class. So we set that up for several different, several different listeners there. So when we wire this up, what does this look like? We have a central event dispatcher object, which is pretty plain as far as it goes. And then we have our separate customer listener class, which we've instantiated there also. So we take dispatcher and call the add listener method. We pass it the name of the event that we want to listen on. And then we pass it basically a PHP callable. In this case, we're, we're saying, hey, we have this customer listener class, call on register when this happens. So like right now, here's what our customer listener object actually looks like. So this method would be called when customer.register is notified or when it's fired. So right here, we can actually use any PHP callable that we want. So we could change this to be a static PHP function which as you guys probably know, a static method does not need a, a, an instantiated object to be called. So we could just do somewhere in our code, customer listener, colon, colon, on register, and then call the method without even instantiating the object. We could if we wanted to. We could also pass it an anonymous function, which could handle it there, right then and there. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper. How does this actually dispatch how does this whole dispatch thing work? 
So as your request is ex or as your request is being handled by your application and your event dispatcher has been wired with several different listeners, an event's going to occur. And that event has a name, which in this case is customer.register, and along with that event is going to have the customer object, the customer that just registered. So that event is going to be dispatched to the event dispatcher. So let's take a quick look and see what that looks like. So this would happen in your controller. You'll see at the top, we've in some way gotten the event dispatcher into our class. Now, depending on your framework or application, this will differ greatly. A lot of frameworks don't really allow you to inject uh, objects into the constructor of your controller. If you're using something like Symphony 2 or Zen Framework 2, you have the concept of your dependency injection container and you could wire your objects elsewhere and then use the dependency injection container to do like this get dispatcher. And it would pull in the dispatcher object that you've pre-wired into your controller. So however your framework does it, uh, figure out the way to inject an object into it. So then we have our new customer uh, method again, and we'll see that we just have our plain Jane customer object. And then we will create an event called customer event and we'll pass it the customer. So now this event encapsulates the customer as well. So it just has, well, I guess I'll get to that in a second. Uh, then we have the, our, the name that we want to dispatch. So we say, hey dispatcher, this event occurred, customer.register occurred, and pass it this event object. So let's jump back to our diagram. We've got our customer event, which is being dispatched. So we'll send it to the dispatcher. The dispatcher takes the event, and says, oh, I know that. I've got an event, I've got an event listener for a customer dot register that needs to call customer listener on register. So the event dispatcher invokes customer listener and goes to on register. It injects the customer event object that came from our controller. So we have our custom event class. And then our listener can use that event to get the current customer that we just had. We could also get the name of the event that invoked it. So we could get customer.register. If for some reason we needed to do some logic based on the event name, we could certainly do that. We can also get a copy of the actual event dispatcher that dispatched it. So if we needed to do like a chained event, we could certainly do that as well. But once you get down to the bottom, you really just do whatever work you need to do. Um, and then of course we're gonna go through some examples of different work you can do. So the customer event class is really simple. It's just a value object that wraps the customer object itself. So it's pretty much saying when your listener uses customer event, it's going to always know that it has a method get customer. Now an event object can have more than one object with it. Or like we have customer in there right now, but we could also have um, like an order event, which could have the order that the user made, uh, we could have the customer that ordered it, we could even have a collection of all the items that were contained within that order. And the customer, or uh, the event class here would just provide a getter for that. So okay, all together now, quick review. Event Dispatcher has listeners, those listeners listen on certain names for events. Events occur within your application, that event gets taken and pushed out to the Event Dispatcher. Event Dispatcher evaluates that and says, ah, yeah, I've got customer.register. Uh, let's notify this listener. It takes the object itself, or the event object, throws it to the customer listener. It does some work, and that's it. That's Event Dispatcher. That's how the concept works. So now let's look at refactoring our controller code that we already have to use this new concept. But I guess before I continue, any like questions or anything? <coughs> The event has, the event is just a simple value object. It, it has really no functionality built into it. So putting that on the model, like there's, there's no logic there. So we don't want to, we don't, we also don't want to couple our event system to our model or like how, how our, how our model interacts with different models and stuff like that, or how it 
get stuff from the database. Like those two concerns should be completely separate. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's refactor our good old object-oriented controller here. So this is where we're going to start because this is what we ended up with at the end of our first refactoring session. And this is where we're going to end up. It may not look all that different from just color-wise, but um, we're going to do some, some refactoring here. So basically, we're going to take a bunch of this code, and we're going to push it down into listeners, which are handled after we dispatch events. OK, so our first step, of course, is to, in some way, get that event dispatcher into our controller. We have to have the dispatcher available to all of our different controller methods to start using it. And I kind of already went through uh, the different ways that you could maybe do that. So let's talk about our first event that happens here. So within our new customer action, we've got the, the logic for creating our new customer from the post request and then sending the email. Um, and then also we've got our disk logger below, which just says, hey, we sent an email. So that's closely related and we'll deal with that here in a second. So let's replace this code with some event-based code. Let's say that we're going to call the customer event customer.register here. So we're taking our new customer object, passing it into our event, and uh, dispatching it to our, our dispatcher. So our customer event, again, is just a really simple value object, wraps the customer class, easy peasy. And then we've got our, this is going to be where we configure all of our uh, event listeners, and this could be in like your dependency injection container, it could be in some other kind of setup bootstrap type area of your code base. Um, you, you'll need to do this wiring or want to do it likely before that event dispatcher gets into your controller. So make that happen in your code base. Uh, so we've got a wel our welcome email class, which is the same one we were using before. We just know that there's a send method on it. It has a two and a name. And then we've got our customer email listener, which is going to accept a new copy of that email. And so when that comes in in the constructor, we just set it to the internal email property on the, on the customer listener. And we'll later use it to send the email down in the onRegister function. So when we register this as a listener, we say when customer.register is fired, I want you to execute method onRegister um, basically with whatever event comes in. Well, we know that a customer event is going to come in because that's how we're going to wire our class. Uh, mm. So welcome email. I think that's where we were. So we'll use on register. It will dispatch our email, which calls that method down there from earlier, the, the email method class. So that's kind of confusing the first time you look at it. But if you're familiar with objects and stuff like that, the more you look at it, the more it makes some sense. So any questions on this? No? Cool. So let's move some more of our code down to a listener. So I said earlier that our our logger functionality here was closely related to our, our sending mail because the boss wants to know uh, just a log of when the email was sent to the client or sent to the the, the, the customer. Yeah. So let's let's take this disk logger and let's push it down into the listener as well. So now we're, we're configuring our disk logger object, which again can be done wherever your bootstrapping process is. The idea of it is to abstract it and pull it and pull the configuration and setup of this object out of your controller. Right? So we have our disk logger, which we'll now inject to our customer email listener. So we've got a copy of the email that comes in there, just as before. And now we'll add our disk logger as an additional uh, constructor argument. So now we, our class can also use that disk logger. So then we can take our logger and simply call the log method on it. Pretty easy. So if we needed, in, if we wanted to test this listener class, it would be really easy for us to instantiate a new object, a new customer email listener, and inject mock objects into the email and the disk logger and verify that our send method and our log method were being called. So the fact that this is a really small class makes it really easy to test and it has seams that we can inject 
objects from outside the context of the object itself. So we've got our disk logger stuff here, and now that we've pushed it down into our listener, we can actually just remove it. We don't even need it in our controller anymore because it's all going to be taken care of by our, our customer.register event when that fires. So let's also talk about our, our email logger, sending email to the boss when something happens. So we're gonna create basically a different listener. So here the responsibility of the different listeners is being kind of determined and one of the listeners was responsible for taking an event and sending an email to the, to the customer and also logging about it. So the responsibility of this listener is to basically take that event, send email to the boss. So these are distinct separate responsibilities. So we're going to create a new listener. So let's first talk about the easy, uh, well we've got our, our boss new customer email and this is really just very similar to our other email object we already created. But in this case, we need to pass in the boss's email. So let's say the boss changes, right? If we were using this in the old fashion, we would have to basically grep or search and replace all through our code base of the boss's old email to the new boss's email. But because this is isolated in one place, we can just go to our configuration or our bootstrap area and change it in one place and it will cascade through the rest of our program. So this class looks really similar to the other email class we have. Again, its responsibility is for sending email to somebody. That's going to be to the boss. So we take the boss's email in as the constructor argument because we need that information before we actually send the email. And then with the send method, all we need to know is the name of the customer that signed up. So then in internal to the class, it builds the email message and just says, hey boss, John Kerry just registered on the site. Pretty sweet, huh? All right, and then we've got our new listener that we're creating. And we're wiring it with our dependencies. So we're taking our email and setting it there through the constructor. And then we can easily invoke it with the new customer event that's passed in when customer.registers is called. So now we've got our email logger stuff from our controller. And we can remove it. We don't need it there in our controller anymore. So as you can see, let's say the boss comes to us the next day and says, hey, um, I need you to also email somebody in our customer relations management department that a new customer signed up. Like we need to get them into the sales funnel. You would create a new listener that listens for the customer.register and it would use a new, it would use that new listener with like a different email object to send an email to like Sherry in CRM, right? When that code is created, we don't have to change our controller. Our controller is fully extensible without needing to change it and we can still evolve what all happens when that event is fired. So let's quickly clean up our other controllers that we've got too. So this is a little more of the same of what we just went through. So we have different, uh, these pieces of highlighted functionality are still customer related. Like if you look where we've got Twitter, tweet, and then we're using the customer object. Um, and then in the bottom we have the email logger, we're using the customer object again. This would be another good place to fire off a customer event because that customer event has access to the customer object. So let's replace the top one with a customer event. Again, we're injecting the customer. We're assuming that it's coming from somewhere. I don't have it in the slide, but where the little comment is at the top, we assume that it's fetched from like the current session or something like that. So we're gonna wire up a new Twitter listener. We're gonna say on order.new call, basically the Twitter, uh, the listener, which has the Twitter object embedded, it does some cool stuff. So Twitter object comes in, it's already been pre-wired, pre-configured. We're gonna inject it into our listener. Oops. We'll inject it into our listener. Our listener will call tweet at order. Uh, that function just gets the current customer. Oh, I have a typo in my code. It should say event get customer, not event get order. Um, really quickly build the tweet and then send the tweet out. And then we can do the same thing for our email logger, pretty simple. Again, we have the, the email class that will be built for to uh, send our boss an email. We have a new listener, wire it up together. I need to not jump so fast. Thought I had more slides in there. Um, anyway, same, same exact concept. We're delegating the responsibility of sending the email to the email class itself. 
and our listener just kind of wires everything together. So now we've taken care of all of our customer event info. Uh, we've, we don't have any more of that stuff going on, right? So now we have some order information that needs to be taken care of. Um, so in like our create order, we have the disk logger, which logs the order number that was uh, created. And in our cancel order, we have the order number there as well. So let's actually create a second event class. Let's create an order event class. And all it's doing is taking a copy of that order object and wrapping it as a value object. Really simple, just like our customer event. So again, we'll wire up our disk logger, which we have already configured and used for our customer event and our customer listeners. That code is now not duplicated anywhere. So we're using the same exact object. We don't have to, if we change it, we can change it in one place and it will be the same object through all the rest of our code base. So we have our disk logger that goes in. Uh, when the event is fired, our on new order method is called. And we really simply, this logger log and add the order number to it. So in this case, we're also going to be logging with the cancel order. So we can pretty much use the same listener, but add an additional method to it. So we have order.cancel. When that's called, let's call on cancel order, which uses the same listener class, and again, the same logger object to write that log to the file. So now we're finished. This is, that was our full refactor to get from our, all of our custom code to now being very extensible using the event dispatcher. So if we look at a list of all of our wired up listeners, we can see that at the very top, we've got a section where we configure all of our dependencies and all of the configuration of those dependencies. So if we wanted to take this a step further, we could do like a, an if statement that says, if we're executing in development, pass in these separate config parameters. We could say log to um, you know, the syslog on our local development machine if we wanted to, or post to this test Twitter account somewhere. Um, you could even take it one further step and abstract which objects are created based on what environment, environment you're in. So that's kind of the event dispatcher and the refactor surrounding it. So some caveats with this whole approach. You know, you can't, you shouldn't ever use one approach as an entire golden hammer. So here's just some notes about, about using the event dispatcher functionality. Listeners are notified in the order that they are registered. So if we're listening on one, on the same event, if we're listening on customer.register, this listener will file first. will fire first. This one will fire second. This is true unless you're using a priority integer when registering the listener. So you could register a listener that has 200 as the priority, and because that's a higher number, it will fire first. This one would fire second. If you're listening on the same event and you have two of the same priority, they will then fall back to firing in the order that they were defined, and that would fire third. But I want to say, don't rely on the priority of executing your listeners. Um, I think it really comes down to the idea that if your code is dependent on the order that your listeners are firing, it's relying on like what I'll get to in a second, which are like side effects. So in some cases, this is really good. Um, like let's say you need to modify the request object based on certain stuff throughout the execution of your code. Okay, that's fine. But if you've got six listeners that kind of are chained together, there's probably something fishy going on there. And you should probably break that code apart or encapsulate it in a better way. So the other caveat is that objects attached to events are passed by reference. And this is pretty much inherent with the way PHP 5 works and its variable assignment. So the fact that they're passed by reference means that this may lead to side effects if you're not careful. So Again, this can be good and bad. It's good if you expect it to happen, but bad when it happens and you don't expect it. So how might this look? So we're wiring our, our uh, event dispatcher with two separate listeners on the same event. And down here, we are setting the email. Let's say we get it from a form somewhere, you know, Mike Smith at Gmail. Uh, our event is dispatched, so we call the first listener 
You can do this get customer get email. We see that the email is still Mike Smith at Gmail. But when we jump down to, well, for whatever reason, we decide to set the email to something new in our listener. We set it to changed at Gmail. So then when that object gets passed down to our next listener, that field is going to be modified. So if you don't expect that to happen, then you're going to have some unexpected results. So this concept can make debugging difficult unless you're really careful with it. And I really think that you can just ask a Drupal developer about that because a lot of Drupal's core functionality, um, their main way for extending core is through like their hook system, which is basically an event system. But has anybody done Drupal development here? So Drupal has, has its module system, which modules can have weights. And you think of module weights as the priority number that I just talked about. So if you have a module that has a hook that's modifying, let's say, a user form somewhere, and you get that user form into your module's hook, but if, you're, if your weight for your module is 200 and something else is 400, and it's modifying that form before you get it, it gets very tricky because you're like, hmm, where in the stack do I need to insert my module to make it modify the form at the right time? So it just gets very, very tricky. You can also ask some Adobe developers. And I found a presentation online from one of the guys at Adobe that said in 2008 that of their desktop application code base, about 33% of it was surrounding event handling and event logic. But that 50% of their code bugs came from this 33% of their code base. So I imagine that their desktop stuff is working with like multi-threaded environments and all kinds of crazy stuff. In PHP, we don't have to usually worry about that because it's single-threaded. It's really procedural in its nature of it's blocking, so it's top to bottom all the time. Um, I, I would assume if you're using event handling and using like a non-blocking language like JavaScript or something like that, it can probably get even more maddening. But anyway, so I'm not saying that this will necessarily apply, but it's just saying be very careful when you're using this kind of stuff. So some other ideas for utilizing events. We've already seen how we've been doing logging. Um, you could also do this to offload expensive operations to a message queue. So the, the concept of a message queue is it's basically an asynchronous job queue that runs as a separate process on your server. So let's say you have something expensive like generating a PDF or doing a really large file access thing like zipping up a log file and FTPing it or transferring it somewhere. You could offload this generation to a message queue by creating a listener that has knowledge of the message queue, which like some message queue API object, and your custom application code. And it just says, hey, message queue, create a new job with, you know, a, for this job, and here's all the data you need to do it. So now your code doesn't have to wait for that execution to finish before it can continue on doing its thing. You could also do it for something like setting the created at and updated at attributes on an entity. So Doctrine 2 has its own event system built into it. So you can listen for certain events, like there's an event called pre-persist that you could listen to that you could say, before this event persists to the database, if created at field is not set, set it to the current timestamp. Stuff like that. You could also use it to update maybe a search index. So if you have like a solar search box that's running somewhere and needs to index entities, or let's say you have a blog post that gets written and you want to index it through your search, you could throw it to solar to index that right then and there. And again, you could also allow your plugins to extend functionality beyond your own code. Um, Are there any other ideas people have come up with kind of while sitting here, just thinking about how this can be used? That you're like, hmm, I wonder if I could use, use this concept in my work. Any thoughts on anything I didn't cover? I think uh, just in the last couple weeks, I got some news. Quite a bit of this WordPress also supports and uses the event system. WordPress does have what it calls a filter system. Filters. Yeah. Um, but they also have action hooks. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, these these are WordPress filters are very similar to the event dispatcher concept. They don't strictly follow the observer pattern or the, or the official design pattern as it's designated, but the concept is similar. Yeah. So I, I think probably the only thing that's really popping in my head is something other than what's on that list. It was nice because I had a third party app that I was able to, that already had events and it already had action modes. And I was able to extend it to do what I needed to do without touching a single line of its code. Yeah. So, so you had a WordPress plugin that already had filters and action stuff built in, and you basically could probably define in your own module or plug in something like that where you're like, hey, when this occurs, I want to do X, Y, and Z, right? So yeah, like the awesome advantage with that is because it's third party code, it's probably going to change upstream somewhere. So if you modified that locally in your project to extend it, you would always have to carry those new changes over into any updated code that you get. So because you can just update it and not have to worry about any original modifications, like that's that's really awesome. And I think that's where Event Dispatcher really shines is making stuff extensible and not having to modify it and still being able to talk to each other. So cool. Um, just some further reading that I encourage you to check out. Uh, Introduction to Symphony 2's Event Dispatcher, which basically goes through most of the stuff I already went through. Um, but if you're using Zen Framework 2, it has the Event Manager, which operates very, very similarly. And if you want some more insight into object-oriented code and building decoupled code, uh, there's a talk here from Uncle Bob or Bob Martin on his uh, solid principles of object-oriented and agile design. Uncle Bob is a somewhat brash individual and has a very unique way of presenting information, but um, I think if you can uh, tolerate his very black and white views, then um, I think he has really lo a lot of really good information. Uh, just some sources that I referenced while here and then my photo credits. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. So if anybody has any other questions, I can definitely field them. Message queue, that idea. Yeah, if you have a long running process, that'd be a great one to delegate to a message queue. And Event Dispatcher makes that, you don't have to leverage Event Dispatcher to do that, of course, but it makes it easy for from your main code base, dumping something off and pushing it out somewhere else. So are the events asynchronous? Like you can have two things bound to an event? Events are not asynchronous because PHP itself is, an, is a blocking language. So it must finish that execution of that event listener before it will proceed on to the next one. That's the benefit of the message queue in that you delegate your long running process stuff out to the message queue and then you can proceed on past it because all your PHP code is concerned with then is creating that new job. And that's really quick because it's just like inserting a row in the database. So it's inserting a row in the database versus just talking to another machine waiting for it to respond. Yeah. So yeah, the event dispatcher only goes through the listeners that are bound to it one after the other. That's why that priority and stuff is important. If this were a non-blocking language, it would probably call all of those instantaneously, right? If this were like JavaScript, if it was like a click handler, if you've ever done click handlers with Ajax or anything and then been puzzled why your response returns from one and then you don't get the data back, you know, it's because of race conditions. Yeah, but, but PHP is a little different in that it waits for that stuff to finish before proceeding on to the next one.